Section 10 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. In Opposition to a New Agrarian Law, Part 1. By Cicero. In Opposition to a New Agrarian Law. Footnote. Delivered to the people in the Roman Forum, Cicero's second oration on the same subject, the first having been delivered in the Senate. Translated by Charles Duke Yong. Abridged. In footnote. 61 B.C. After a very long interval, almost beyond the memory of our times, you have for the first time made me, a new man, consul, and you have opened that rank which the nobles have held strengthened by guards and fenced round in every possible manner in my instance first, and have resolved that it should in future be open to virtue. Nor have you only made me consul, though that is of itself a most honourable thing, but you have made me so in such a way as very few nobles in this city have ever been made consuls before in, and no new man whatever before me. For in truth, if you please to recollect, you will find that those new men who have at any time been made consuls without a repulse have been elected after long toil and on some critical emergency having stood for it many years after they had been praetors and a good deal later than they might have done according to the laws regulating the age of candidates for the office but that those who stood for it in their regular year were not elected without a repulse that I am the only one of all the new men whom we can remember who has stood for the consulship in the first moment that by law I could, who has been elected consul the first time that I have stood, so that this honour which you have conferred on me, having been sought by me at the proper time, appears not to have been filched by me on the occasion of some unpopular candidate offering himself, not to have been gained by long perseverance in asking for it, but to have been fairly earned by my worth and dignity. This also is a most honourable thing for me, Romans, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, that I am the first new man for many years on whom you have conferred this honour, that you have conferred it on my first application in my proper year. But yet nothing can be more splendid or more honourable for me than this circumstance, that at the comedia at which I was elected you delivered not your ballot, the vindication of your silent liberty, but your eager voices as the witnesses of your good will toward and zeal for me. And so it was not the last tribe of the votes, but the very first moment of your meeting. It was not the single voices of the criers, but the whole Roman people with one voice that declared me consul. I think this eminent and unprecedented kindness of yours, Romans, of great weight as a reward for my courage, and is a source of joy to me, but still more calculated to impress me with care and anxiety. For Romans, many and grave thoughts occupy my mind, which allow me but little rest day or night. First there is anxiety about discharging the duties of the consulship, which is a difficult and important business to all men, and especially to me above all other men, for if I err, I shall obtain no pardon. If I do well, I shall get but little praise, and that too extorted from unwilling people. If I am in doubt, I have no faithful counsellors to whom I can apply. If I am in difficulty, I have no sure assistance from the nobles on which I can depend. For I will speak the truth, Romans. I cannot find fault with the general principle of an agrarian law. For it occurs to my mind that two most illustrious men, two most able men, two most thoroughly attached to the Roman people, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus established the people on public domains which had previously been occupied by private individuals. Nor am I a consul of such opinions as to think it wrong, as most men do, to praise the Gracchi, by whose counsels and wisdom and laws I see that many parts of the Republic have been greatly strengthened. Therefore, when at the very beginning I, being the consul-elect, was informed that the tribunes-elect of the people were drawing up an agrarian law, I wished to ascertain what their plans were. In truth, I thought that since we were both to act as magistrates in the same year, it was right that there should be some union between us, for the purpose of governing the Republic wisely and successfully. When I wished to join them familiarly in conversation, I was shut out. Their projects were concealed from me. 
and when I assured them that, if the law appeared to me to be advantageous to the Roman people, I would assist them in it and promote it, still they rejected this liberality of mine with scorn, and said that I could not possibly be induced to approve of any liberal measures. I do assert to you, Romans, that by this beautiful agrarian law, by this law calculated solely for the good of the people, nothing whatever is given to you. Everything is sacrificed to a few particular men. That lands are displayed before the eyes of the Roman people, liberty is taken away from them, that the fortunes of some private individuals are increased, the public wealth is exhausted, and lastly, which is the most scandalous thing of all, that by means of a tribune of the people, whom our ancestors designed to be the protector and guardian of liberty, kings are being established in the city. And when I have shown to you all the grounds for this statement, if they appear to you to be erroneous, I will yield to your authority. I will abandon my own opinion. But if you become aware that plots are laid against your liberty under a pretense of liberality, then do not hesitate, now that you have a consul to assist you, to defend that liberty which was earned by the sweat and blood of your ancestors, and handed down to you without any trouble on your part. The first clause in this agrarian law is one by which, as they think, you are a little proved to see with what feelings you can bear a diminution of your liberty. For it orders the tribune of the people who has passed this law to create ten decemvirs by the votes of seventeen tribes, so that whomsoever a majority consisting of nine tribes elects shall be a decemvir. On this I ask, on what account the framer of this law has commenced his law and his measures in such a manner as to deprive the Roman people of its right of voting? As often as agrarian laws have been passed, commissioners, and triumvirs, and quinquevirs, and decemvirs have been appointed. I ask this tribune of the people who is so attached to the people, whether they were ever created except by the whole thirty-five tribes. In truth, as it is proper for every power, and every command, and every charge which is committed to any one to proceed from the entire Roman people, so especially ought these to do so, which are established for any use and advantage of the Roman people, as that is a case in which they all together choose the man, who they think will most study the advantage of the Roman people, and in which also each individual among them by his own zeal and his own vote, assists to make a road by which he may obtain some individual benefit for himself. This is the tribune to whom it has occurred above all others to deprive the Roman people of their suffrages, and to invite a few tribes, not by any fixed condition of law, but by the kindness of lots drawn, and by chance, to usurp the liberties belonging to all. Who passed the law? Rullus. Footnote. Publius Servilius Rullus, a tribune of the people, end footnote. Who prevented the greater portion of the people from having a vote? Rullus. Who presided over the comitia? Who summoned to the election whatever tribes he pleased, having drawn the lots for them without any witness being present to see fair play? Who appointed whatever decemvirs he chose? This same Rullus. Whom did he appoint chief of the decemvirs? Rullus. I hardly believe that he could induce his own slaves to approve of this, much less you who are the masters of all nations. Therefore the most excellent laws will be repealed by this law without the least suspicion of the fact. He will seek for a commission of himself by virtue of his own law. He will hold comitia, though the greater portion of the people is stripped of their votes. He will appoint whomsoever he pleases and himself among them, and forsooth he will not reject his own colleagues, the backers of this agrarian law, by whom the first place in the unpopularity which may possibly arise from drawing the law, and from having his name at the head of it, has indeed been conceded to him. But the profit from the whole business, they who in the hope of it are placed in this position, reserve to themselves in equal shares with him. But now take notice of the diligence of the man, if indeed you think that Rullus contrived this, or that it is a thing which could possibly have occurred to Rullus. Those men who first projected these measures saw that, if you had the power of making your selection out of the whole people, whatever the matter might be in which good faith, integrity, virtue, 
and authority were required, you would beyond all question entrust it to Gnaeus Pompeius as the chief manager. Footnote. Pompey the Great, in the year of this oration, had just ended the war with Mithridates, had annexed Syria and Palestine to Rome, and had a triumph. In the following year he became a triumvir with Caesar and Crassus. In footnote. In truth, after you had chosen one man out of all the citizens, and appointed him to conduct all your wars against all nations by land and sea, they saw plainly that it was most natural that, when you were appointing decemvirs, whether it was to be looked on as committing a trust to, or conferring an honor on a man, you would commit the business to him, and most reasonable that he should have this compliment paid him. Therefore an exception is made by this law, mentioning not youth, nor any legal impediment, nor any command or magistracy, which might be encumbered with obstacles arising either from the business with which it was already loaded, or from the laws. There is not even an exception made in the case of any convicted person to prevent his being made a decemvir. Gnaeus Pompeius is accepted and disabled from being elected, a colleague of Publius Rellus, for I say nothing of the rest. For he has worded the law so that only those who are present can stand for the office, a clause which was never yet found in any other law, not even in the laws concerning those magistrates who are periodically elected. But this clause was inserted in order that if the law passed, you might not be able to give him a colleague who would be a guardian over him, and a check upon his covetousness. Here, since I see that you are moved by the dignity of the man, and by the insult put upon him by this law, I will return to the assertion that I made at the beginning, that a kingly power is being erected, and your liberties entirely taken away by this law. Did you think otherwise, that when a few men had cast the eyes of covetousness on all your possessions, they would not, in the very first place, take care that Gnaeus Pompeius should be removed from all power of protecting your liberty, from all power to promote, from all commission to watch over, and from all means of protecting your interests? They saw, and they see still, that if through your own imprudence and my negligence you adopt this law, without understanding its effect, you would afterward, when you were creating decemvirs, think it expedient to oppose Gnaeus Pompeius as your defense against all defects and wickednesses in the law. And is this a slight argument to you, that these are men by whom dominion and power over everything is sought, when you see that he, whom they see, will surely be the protector of your liberty, is the only one to whom that dignity is denied? Besides all this, he gives the decemvirs authority praetorian in name but kingly in reality. He describes their power as a power for five years, but he makes it perpetual, for he strengthens it with such bulwarks and defenses that it will be quite impossible to deprive them of it against their own consent. Then he adorns them with apparitors, and secretaries, and clerks, and criers, and architects, besides that with mules, and tents, and centuries, and all sorts of furniture, he draws money for their expenses from the treasury. He supplies them with more money from the allies. He appoints them two hundred surveyors from the equestrian body every year as their personal attendants, and also as ministers and satellites of their power. You have now, O Romans, the form and very appearance of tyrants. You see all the ensigns of power, but not yet the power itself. For perhaps someone may say, well, what harm do all those men, secretary, lictor, crier, and chicken feeder do me? I will tell you. These things are of such a nature that the man who has them without their being conferred by your vote must seem either a monarch with intolerable power, or if he assumes them as a private individual, a madman. Just see what great authority they are invested with, and you will say that it is not the insanity of private individuals, but the immoderate arrogance of kings. First of all, they are entrusted with boundless power of acquiring enormous sums of money out of your revenues, not by farming them, but by alienating them. In the next place, they are allowed to pursue an inquiry into the conduct of every country and of every nation, without any bench of judges to punish without any right of appeal being allowed, and to condemn without there being any means of procuring a reversal of their sentence. They will be able for five years to sit in judgment on the consuls, 
or even on the tribunes of the people themselves. But all that time no one will be able to sit in judgment on them. They will be allowed to fill magisterial offices, but they will not be allowed to be prosecuted. They will have power to purchase lands from whomsoever they choose, whatever they choose, and at whatever price they choose. They are allowed to establish new colonies, to recruit old ones, to fill all Italy with their colonists. They have absolute authority for visiting every province, for depriving free people of their lands, for giving or taking away kingdoms whenever they please. They may be at Rome when it is convenient to them, but they have a right also to wander about wherever they like with supreme command, and with a power of sitting in judgment on everything. They are allowed to put an end to all criminal trials, to remove from the tribunals whoever they think fit, to decide by themselves on the most important matters, to delegate their power to a questor, to send about surveyors, and to ratify whatever the surveyor has reported to that single decemvir by whom he has been sent. It is a defect in my language, Romans, when I call this power a kingly power, for in truth it is something much more considerable. For there never was any kingly power that, if it was not defined by some express law, was not at least understood to be subject to certain limitations. But this power is absolutely unbounded. It is one within which all kingly powers, and your own imperial authority, which is of such wide extent, and all other powers, whether freely exercised by your permission, or existing only by your tacit countenance, are, by express permission of the law, comprehended. End of section 10. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 11 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. In Opposition to a New Agrarian Law, Part 2. By Cicero. Footnote. Delivered to the people in the Roman Forum, Cicero's second oration on the same subject, the first having been delivered in the Senate. Translated by Charles Duke Young. Abridged. In footnote. 61 B.C. You have now seen how many things and what valuable things the decemvirs are likely to sell with the sanction of the law. That is not enough. When they have sated themselves with the blood of the allies, and of foreign nations, and of kings, they will then cut the sinews of the Roman people. They will lay hands on your revenues, they will break into your treasury. For a clause follows, in which he is not content with permitting, if by chance any money should be wanting, which, however, can be amassed in such quantities from the effect of the previous clauses that it ought not to be wanting, but which actually, as if that was likely to be the salvation of you all, orders and compels the decemvirs to sell all your revenues, naming each item separately. And do you now read to me in regular order the catalogue of the property of the Roman people which is for sale according to the written provisions of this law? A catalogue which I think, in truth, will be miserable and grievous to the very crier himself. He is as prodigal a spendthrift with regard to the property of the Republic as a private individual is with regard to his own estate, who sells his woods before he sells his vineyards. You have gone all through Italy, now go on into Sicily. There is nothing in that province which your ancestors have left to you as your own property, either in the towns or in the fields, which he does not order to be sold. All that property, which having been gained by their recent victory, your ancestors left to you in the cities and territories of the Allies, as both a bond of peace and a monument of war, will you now, though you received it from them, sell it at this man's instigation? Here for a moment I seem, O Romans, to move your feelings, while I make plain to you the plots which they think have escaped every one's notice as having been laid by them against the dignity of Gnaeus Pompeius. And I beseech you, pardon me if I am forced to make frequent mention of that man's name. You, Romans, imposed this character on me two years ago in this very same place and bound me to share with you in the protection of his dignity during his absence, in whatever manner I could. I have hitherto done all that I could, 
not because I was persuaded to it by my intimacy with him, nor from any hope of honour, or of any most honourable dignity which I have gained by your means in his absence, though no doubt with his perfect good will. Wherefore, when I perceive that nearly the whole of this law is made ready, as if it were an engine for the object of overthrowing his power, I will both resist the designs of the men who have contrived it, and I will enable you not only to perceive, but to be entire masters of the whole plot which I now see in preparation. But I beg you now, O Romans, to take notice how Rullus is planning to besiege and occupy all Italy with his garrison. He permits the decemvirs to lead colonists, whomsoever he may choose to select, into every municipality, and into every colony in all Italy, and he orders lands to be assigned to those colonists. Is there any obscurity here in the way in which greater powers and greater defences than your liberty can tolerate are sought after? Is there any obscurity here in the manner in which kingly power is established? Is there any disguise about your liberty being wholly destroyed? For when it is one and the same body of men who with their resources lay siege, as it were, to all the riches and all the population, that is to say, to all Italy, and who propose to hold all your liberties in blockade by their garrisons and colonies, what hope, ay, what possibility even, is left to you of ever recovering your liberty? But the Campanian district, the most fertile section of the whole world, is to be divided in accordance with the provisions of this law, and a colony is to be led to Capua, a most honourable and beautiful city. But what can we say to this? For this is what I say. If the Campanian land be divided, the common people are driven out of and banished from the lands, not settled and established in them. For the whole of the Campanian district is cultivated and occupied by the common people, and by a most virtuous and moderate common people. And that race of men of most virtuous habits, that race of excellent farmers and excellent soldiers, is wholly driven out by this tribune who is so devoted to the people. And these miserable men, born and brought up on these lands, practised in tilling the ground, will have no place to which, when so suddenly driven out, they can betake themselves. The entire possession of the Campanian district will be given over to these robust, vigorous, and audacious satellites of the Decemvirs. And as you now say of your ancestors, our ancestors left us these lands, so your posterity will say of you, our ancestors received these lands from their ancestors, but lost them. I think indeed that if the Campus Martins were to be divided, and if every one of you had two feet of standing ground allotted to him in it, still you would prefer to enjoy the whole of it together than for each individual to have a small portion for his own private property. Wherefore, even if some portion of these lands were to come to every individual among you, which is now indeed held out to you as a lure, but is in reality destined for others, still they would be a more honourable possession to you when possessed by the whole body than if distributed in bits to each citizen. But now, when you are not to have any share in them, but when they are being prepared for others and taken from you, will you not most vigorously resist this law as you would an armed enemy fighting in defence of your lands? Then that standard of a Campanian colony, greatly to be dreaded by this empire, will be erected at Capua by the Decemvirs. Then that other Rome, which has been heard of before, will be sought in opposition to this Rome, the common country of all of us. Impious men are endeavouring to transfer our republic to that town, in which our ancestors decided that there should be no republic at all, when they resolved that there were but three cities in the whole earth, Carthage, Corinth, and Capua, which could aspire to the power and name of the imperial city. Carthage has been destroyed, because, both from its vast population and from the natural advantages of its situation, being surrounded with harbours and fortified with walls, it appeared to project out of Africa, and to threaten the most productive islands of the Roman people. Of Corinth there is scarcely a vestige left, for it was situated on the straits and in the very jaws of Greece, in such a way that by land it held the keys of many countries, and that it almost connected two seas, 
equally desirable for purposes of navigation, which were separated by the smallest possible distance. These towns, though they were out of the sight of the empire, our ancestors not only crushed, but as I have said before, utterly destroyed, that they might never be able to recover and rise again and flourish. Concerning Capua they deliberated much and long. Public documents are extant, O Romans, many resolutions of the Senate are extant. Those wise men decided that if they took away from the Campanians their lands, their magistrates, their senate, and the public council of that city, they would leave no image whatever of the Republic, there would be no reason whatever for their fearing Capua. Therefore you will find this written in ancient records, that there should be a city which might be able to supply the means for the cultivation of the Campanian district, that there should be a place for collecting the crops in and storing them, in order that the farmers, when wearied with the cultivation of the lands, might avail themselves of the homes afforded them by the city and that on that account the buildings of the city were not destroyed. See now how wide is the distance between the councils of our ancestors and the insane projects of these men. They chose Capua to be a refuge for our farmers, a market for the country people, a barn and granary for the Campanian district. These men, having expelled the farmers, have wasted and squandered your revenues, are raising this same Capua into the seat of a new republic, are preparing a vast mass to be an enemy to the old republic. But if our ancestors had thought that any one in such an illustrious empire, in such an admirable constitution as that of the Roman people, would have been like Marcus Brutus or Publius Rullus, for these are the only two men whom we have hitherto seen, who have wished to transfer all this republic to Capua, they would not in truth have left even the name of that city in existence. But they thought that in the case of Corinth and Carthage, even if they had taken away their senates and their magistrates and deprived the citizens of the lands, still men would not be wanting who would restore those cities and change the existing state of things in them before we could hear of it. But here, under the very eyes of the senate and Roman people, they thought that nothing could take place which might not be put down and extinguished before it had got to any head, or had assumed any definite shape. Nor did that matter deceive those men, endued as they were with divine wisdom and prudence. For after the consulship of Quintus Fulvius and Quintus Fabius, by whom when they were consuls Capua was defeated and taken, I will not say that there has been nothing done, but nothing has been even imagined in that city against this republic. Many wars have been waged since that time with kings, with Philip, and Antiochus, and Perses, and Pseudo-Philippus, and Aristonicus, and Mithridates, and others. Many terrible wars have existed besides, the Carthaginian, the Corinthian, and the Numantian wars. There have been also many domestic seditions which I pass over. There have been wars with our allies, the Fragellan War, the Marsic War, in all which domestic and foreign wars Capua has not only not been any hindrance to us, but has afforded us most seasonable assistance in providing the means of war, in equipping our armies, and receiving them in their houses and homes. There were no men in the city who by evil disposed assemblies, by turbulent resolutions of the Senate, or by unjust exertions of authority, threw the Republic into confusion, and sought pretexts for revolution. For no one had any power of summoning an assembly, or of convening any public council. Men were not carried away by any desire for renown, because where there are no honors, publicly conferred, there can be no covetous desire of reputation. They were not quarreling with one another out of rivalry or out of ambition, for they had nothing left to quarrel about. They had nothing which they could seek for in opposition to one another. They had no room for dissensions. Therefore it was in accordance with a deliberate system, and with real wisdom, that our ancestors changed the natural arrogance and intolerable ferocity of the Campanians into a thoroughly inactive and lazy tranquillity. And by this means they avoided the reproach of cruelty, because they did not destroy from off the face of Italy a most beautiful city, and they provided well for the future, in that having cut out all the sinews of the city, they left the city itself enfeebled and disabled. 
ought we not to think that those men who foresaw all these things romans ought to be venerated and worshipped by us and classed almost in the number of the immortal gods for what was it which they saw they saw this which i entreat you now to remark and take notice of manners are not implanted in men so much by the blood and family as by those things which are supplied by the nature of the plan toward forming habits of life by which we are nourished and by which we live the carthaginians a fraudulent and lying nation were tempted to a fondness for deceiving by a desire of gain not by their blood but by the character of their situation because owing to the number of their harbors they had frequent intercourse with merchants and foreigners the ligurians being mountaineers are a hardy and rustic tribe the land itself taught them to be so by producing nothing which was not extracted from it by skilful cultivation and by great labor the campanians were always proud from the excellence of their soil and the magnitude of their crops and the healthiness and position and beauty of their city from that abundance and from this affluence in all things in the first place originated those qualities arrogance which demanded of our ancestors that one of the consuls should be chosen from capua and in the second place that luxury which conquered hannibal himself by pleasure who up to that time had proved invincible in arms when those decemvirs shall in accordance with the law of rullus have led six hundred colonists to that place when they shall have established there a hundred decurions ten augurs and ten priests what do you suppose their courage and violence and ferocity will be then they will laugh at and despise rome situated among mountains and valleys stuck up as it were and raised aloft amid garrets with not very good roads and with very narrow streets in comparison with their own capua stretched out along a most open plain and in comparison of their own beautiful thoroughfares and as for the lands they will not think the vatican or Papinian district fit to be compared at all to their fertile and luxuriant plains and all the abundance of neighboring towns which surround us they will compare in laughter and scorn with their neighbors they will compare labici fidenza calatia even lanuvium itself and arecia and tusculum with calus and tianum and naples and putioli and Cumai, and Pompeii, and Nucaria. By all these things they will be elated and puffed up, perhaps not at once, but certainly when they have got a little more age and vigor they will not be able to restrain themselves. They will go on further and further. A single individual, unless he be a man of great wisdom, can scarcely, when placed in situations of great wealth or power, contain himself within the limits of propriety much less will those colonists sought out and selected by rullus and others like rullus when established at capua in that abode of pride and in the very home of luxury refrain from immediately contracting some wickedness and iniquity ay and it will be much more the case with them than with the old genuine campanians because they were born and trained up in a fortune which was theirs of old but were deprived by a too great abundance of everything but these men being transferred from the most extreme indigence to a corresponding affluence will be affected not only by the extent of their riches but also by the strangeness of them i do not wonder that you men of such folly and intemperance as you are should have desired these things i do marvel that you should have hoped that you could obtain them while i am consul for as all consuls ought to exercise the greatest care and diligence in the protection of the republic so above all others ought they to do so who have not been made consuls in their cradles but in the campus no ancestors of mine went bail to the roman people for me you gave credit to me it is from me that you must claim what i am bound to pay all your demands must be made on me as when i stood for the consulship no authors of my family recommended me to you so if i commit any fault there are no images of my ancestors which can beg me off from you wherefore if only life be granted me as far as i can i will defend the state from the wickedness and insidious designs of those men i promise you this o romans with good faith you have entrusted the republic to a vigilant man not to a timid one to a diligent man not to an idle one 
I am consul. How should I fear an assembly of the people? How should I be afraid of the tribunes of the people? How should I be frequently or causelessly agitated? How should I fear, lest I may have to dwell in a prison, if a tribune of the people orders me to be led thither? For I, armed with your arms, adorned with your most honorable ensigns, and with command and authority conferred by you, have not been afraid to advance into this place, and with you for my backers, to resist the wickedness of man. Nor do I fear lest the Republic, being fortified with such strong protection, may be conquered or overwhelmed by those men. If I had been afraid before, still, now, with this assembly and this people, I should not fear. For who ever had an assembly so well inclined to hear him while advocating an agrarian law, as I have had while arguing against one? If indeed I can be said to be arguing against one, and not rather upsetting and destroying one. From which, Romans, it may be easily understood that there is nothing so popular as that which I, the consul of the people, am this year bringing to you, namely peace, tranquillity, and ease. All the things which, when we were elected, you were afraid might happen, have been guarded against by my prudence and caution. You not only will enjoy ease, you who have always wished for it, but I will even make those men quiet to whom our quiet has been a source of annoyance. End of section 11. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 12 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hollywood Fatcat. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. The First Oration Against Catiline by Cicero. Footnote. Delivered in the Roman Senate in 63 B.C. Translated by Charles Duke Young. End of footnote. When, O oh Catiline, do you mean to cease abusing our patience? How long is that madness of yours still to mock us? When is there to be an end of that unbridled audacity of yours, swaggering about as it does now? Do not the nightly guards placed on the Palatine Hill, do not the watches posted throughout the city, does not the alarm of the people and the union of all good men, does not the precaution taken of assembling the Senate in this most defensible place, do not the looks and countenances of this venerable body here present have any effect upon you? Do you not feel that your plans are detected? Do you not see that your conspiracy is already arrested and rendered powerless by the knowledge of which every one here possesses of it? What is there that you did last night? What the night before? Where is it that you were? Who was there that you summoned to meet you? What design was there which was adopted by you with which you think that any one of us is unacquainted? Shame on the age and on its principles. The Senate is aware of these things, the Consul sees them, and yet this man lives. Lives! Ay, he comes even into the Senate. He takes a part in the public deliberations. He is watching and marking down and checking off for slaughter every individual among us. And we, gallant men that we are, think that we are doing our duty to the Republic if we keep out of the way of his frenzied attacks. You ought, O Catiline, long ago to have been led to execution by command of the consul. That destruction which you have been long plotting against us ought to have already fallen on your own head. What, did not that most illustrious man, Publius Scipio, the Pontifex Maximus, in his capacity of a private citizen, put to death Tiberius Gracchus, though but slightly undermining the Constitution? And shall we, who are the consuls, tolerate Catiline, openly desirous to destroy the whole world with fire and slaughter? For I pass over older instances, such as how Caius Servilius Ahala with his own hand slew Spurius Milius when plotting a revolution in the state. There was, there was once such virtue in this republic that brave men would repress mischievous citizens with severer chastisement than the most bitter enemy. For we have a resolution of the Senate, 
a formidable and authoritative decree against you o catiline the wisdom of the republic is not at fault nor the dignity of this senatorial body we we alone i say it openly we the consuls are wanting in our duty the senate once passed a decree that lucius opimius the consul should take care that the republic suffered no injury not one night elapsed there was put to death on some mere suspicion of disaffection caius gracchus a man whose family had borne the most unblemished reputation for many generations there was slain marcus fulvius a man of consular rank and all his children by a like decree of the senate the safety of the republic was entrusted to caius marius and lucius valerius the consuls did not the vengeance of the republic did not the execution overtake lucius saturninus a tribune of the people and caius servilius the praetor without the delay of one single day but we for these twenty days have been allowing the edge of the senate's authority to grow blunt as it were for we are in possession of a similar decree of the senate but we keep it locked up in its parchment buried i may say in the sheath and according to this decree you ought o catiline to be put to death this instant you live and you live not to lay aside but to persist in your audacity i wish o conscript fathers to be merciful i wish not to appear negligent amid such danger to the state but i do now accuse myself of remissness and culpable inactivity a camp is pitched in italy at the entrance of etruria in hostility to the republic the number of the enemy increases every day and yet the general of that camp the leader of those enemies we see within the walls ay and even in the senate planning every day some internal injury to the republic if o catiline i should now order you to be arrested to be put to death i should i suppose have to fear lest all good men should say that i had acted tardily rather than that any one should affirm that i acted cruelly but yet this which ought to have been done long since i have good reason for not doing as yet i will put you to death then when there shall be not one person possible to be found so wicked so abandoned so like yourself as not to allow that it has been rightly done as long as one person exists who can dare to defend you you shall live but you shall live as you do now surrounded by my many and trusty guards so that you shall not be able to stir one finger against the republic many eyes and ears shall still observe and watch you as they have hitherto done though you shall not perceive them for what is there o catiline that you can still expect if night is not able to veil your nefarious meetings in darkness and if private houses cannot conceal the voice of your conspiracy within their walls if everything is seen and displayed change your mind trust me forget the slaughter and conflagration you are meditating you are hemmed in on all sides all your plans are clearer than the day to us let me remind you of them do you recollect that on the twenty first of october i said in the senate that on a certain day which was to be the twenty seventh of october c manlius the satellite and servant of your audacity would be in arms was i mistaken catiline not only in so important so atrocious so incredible a fact but what is much more remarkable in the very day i said also in the senate that you had fixed the massacre of the nobles for the twenty eighth of october when many chief men of the senate had left rome not so much for the sake of saving themselves as of checking your designs can you deny that on that very day you were so hemmed in by my guards and my vigilance that you were unable to stir one finger against the republic when you said that you would be content with the flight of the rest and the slaughter of us who remained what when you made sure that you would be able to seize Prineste on the first of november by a nocturnal attack did you not find that that colony was fortified by my order by my garrison by my watchfulness and care 
you do nothing you plan nothing you think of nothing which i not only do not hear but which i do not see and know every particular of listen while i speak of the night before you shall now see that i watch far more actively for the safety than you do for the destruction of the republic i say that you came the night before i will say nothing obscurely into the scythe dealer street to the house of marcus lecca that many of your accomplices in the same insanity and wickedness came there too do you dare to deny it why are you silent i will prove it if you do deny it for i see here in the senate some men who were there with you o oh, ye immortal gods where on earth are we in what city are we living what constitution is ours there are here here in our body o conscript fathers in this most holy and dignified assembly of the whole world men who meditate my death and the death of all of us and the destruction of this city and of the whole world i the consul see them i ask them their opinion about the republic and i do not yet attack even by my words those who ought to be put to death by the sword you were then o catiline at lecca's that night you divided italy into sections you settled where every one was to go you fixed whom you were to leave at rome whom you were to take with you you portioned out the divisions of the city for conflagration you undertook that you yourself would at once leave the city and said that there was then only this to delay you that i was still alive two roman knights were found to deliver you from this anxiety and to promise that very night before daybreak to slay me in my bed all this i knew almost before your meeting had broken up i strengthened and fortified my house with a stronger guard i refused admittance when they came to those whom you sent in the morning to salute me and of whom i had foretold to many eminent men that they would come to me at that time as then this is the case o catiline continue as you have begun leave the city at least the gates are open depart that manlian camp of yours has been waiting too long for you as its general and lead forth with you all your friends or at least as many as you can purge the city of your presence you will deliver me from a great fear when there is a wall between you and me among us you can dwell no longer i will not bear it i will not permit it i will not tolerate it great thanks are due to the immortal gods and to this very jupiter stator in whose temple we are the most ancient protector of this city that we have already so often escaped so foul so horrible and so deadly an enemy to the republic but the safety of the commonwealth must not be too often allowed to be risked on one man as long as you o catiline plotted against me while i was the consul elect i defended myself not with a public guard but by my own private diligence when in the next consular comitia you wished to slay me when i was actually consul and your competitors also in the campus martius i checked your nefarious attempt by the assistance and resources of my own friends without exciting any disturbance publicly in short as often as you attacked me i by myself opposed you and that too though i saw that my ruin was connected with great disaster to the republic but now you are openly attacking the entire republic you are summoning to destruction and devastation the temples of the immortal gods the houses of the city the lives of all the citizens in short all italy wherefore since i do not yet venture to do that which is the best thing and which belongs to my office and to the discipline of our ancestors i will do that which is more merciful if we regard its rigor and more expedient for the state for if i order you to be put to death the rest of the conspirators will still remain in the republic if as i have long been exhorting you you depart your companions those worthless dregs of the republic will be drawn off from the city too what is the matter catiline 
do you hesitate to do that when i order you which you are already doing of your own accord the consul orders an enemy to depart from the city do you ask me are you to go into banishment i do not order it but if you consult me i advise it for what is there o catiline that can now afford you any pleasure in this city for there is no one in it except that band of profligate conspirators of yours who does not fear you no one who does not hate you what brand of domestic baseness is not stamped upon your life what disgraceful circumstance is wanting to your infamy in your private affairs from what licentiousness have your eyes from what atrocity have your hands from what iniquity has your whole body ever abstained is there one youth when you have once entangled him in the temptations of your corruption to whom you have not held out a sword for audacious crime or a torch for licentious wickedness what when lately by the death of your former wife you had made your house empty and ready for a new bridal did you not even add another incredible wickedness to this wickedness but i pass that over and willingly allow it to be buried in silence that so horrible a crime may not be seen to have existed in this city and not to have been chastised i pass over the ruin of your fortune which you know is hanging over you against the ides of the very next month i come to those things which relate not to the infamy of your private vices not to your domestic difficulties and baseness but to the welfare of the republic and to the lives and safety of us all can the light of this life o catiline can the breath of this atmosphere be pleasant to you when you know that there is not one man of those here present who is ignorant that you on the last day of the year when lepidus and tullus were consuls stood in the assembly armed that you had prepared your hand for the slaughter of the consuls and chief men of the senate and that no reason or fear of yours hindered your crime and madness but the fortune of the republic and i say no more of these things for they are not unknown to every one how often have you endeavoured to slay me both as consul-elect and as actual consul how many shots of yours so aimed that they seemed impossible to be escaped have i avoided by some slight stooping aside and some dodging as it were of my body you attempt nothing you execute nothing you devise nothing that can be kept hid from me at the proper time and yet you do not cease to attempt and to contrive how often already has that dagger of yours been wrested from your hands how often has it slipped through them by some chance and dropped down and yet you cannot any longer do without it and to what sacred mysteries it is consecrated and devoted by you i know not that you think it necessary to plunge it in the body of the consul but now what is that life of yours that you are leading for i will speak to you not so as to seem influenced by the hatred i ought to feel but by pity nothing of which is due to you you came a little while ago into the senate in so numerous an assembly who of so many friends and connections of yours saluted you if this in the memory of man never happened to any one else are you waiting for insults by word of mouth when you are overwhelmed by the most irresistible condemnation of silence is it nothing that at your arrival all those seats were vacated that all the men of consular rank who had often been marked out by you for slaughter the very moment you sat down left that part of the benches bare and vacant with what feelings do you think you ought to bear this on my honour if my slaves feared me as all your fellow-citizens fear you i should think i must leave my house do not you think you should leave the city if i say that i was even undeservedly so suspected and hated by my fellow-citizens i would rather flee from their sight than be gazed at by the hostile eyes of every one and do you who from the consciousness of your wickedness know that the hatred of all men is just and has been long due to you hesitate to avoid the sight and presence of those men whose minds and senses you offend if your parents feared and hated you 
and if you could by no means pacify them, you would, I think, depart somewhere out of their sight. Now your country, which is the common parent of all of us, hates and fears you, and has no other opinion of you than that you are meditating parricide in her case, and will you neither feel awe of her authority, nor deference for her judgment, nor fear of her power? And she, O oh Catiline, thus pleads with you, and after a manner silently speaks to you. There has now for many years been no crime committed but by you. No atrocity has taken place without you. You alone, unpunished and unquestioned, have murdered the citizens, have harassed and plundered the allies. You alone have had power not only to neglect all laws and investigations, but to overthrow and break through them. Your former actions, though they ought not to have been borne, yet I did bear as well as I could. But now that I should be wholly occupied with fear of you alone, that at every sound I should dread Catiline, that no design should seem possible to be entertained against me which does not proceed from your wickedness, this is no longer endurable. Depart, then, and deliver me from this fear, that if it be a just one, I may not be destroyed, if an imaginary one, that at least I may at last cease to fear. If, as I have said, your country were thus to address you, ought she not to obtain her request, even if she were not able to enforce it? What shall I say of your having given yourself into custody? What of your having said, for the sake of avoiding suspicion, that you were willing to dwell in the house of Marcus Lepidus. And when you were not received by him, you dared even to come to me, and begged me to keep you in my house. And when you had received answer from me that I could not possibly be safe in the same house with you, when I considered myself in great danger as long as we were in the same city, you came to Quintus Metellus, the praetor, and being rejected by him, you passed on to your associate, that most excellent man, Marcus Marcellus, who would be, I suppose you thought, most diligent in guarding you, most sagacious in suspecting you, and most bold in punishing you. But how far can we think that man ought to be from bonds and imprisonment who has already judged himself deserving of being given into custody? Since then this is the case, do you hesitate, O Catiline, if you cannot remain here with tranquillity to depart to some distant land and to trust your life saved from just and deserved punishment to flight and solitude make a motion say you to the senate for that is what you demand and if this body votes that you ought to go into banishment you say that you will obey i will not make such a motion it is contrary to my principles and yet i will let you see what these men think of you be gone from the city, O Catiline. Deliver the Republic from fear. Depart into banishment, if that is the word you are waiting for. What now, O Catiline? Do you not perceive? Do you not see the silence of these men? They permit it. They say nothing. Why wait you for the authority of their words when you see their wishes in their silence? But I had said the same to this excellent young man, Publius Sextus, or to that brave man, Marcus Marcellus, before this time the Senate would deservedly have laid violent hands on me, consul though I be, in this very temple. But as to you, Catiline, while they are quiet, they approve. While they permit me to speak, they vote. While they are silent, they are loud and eloquent. And not they alone, whose authority, forsooth, is dear to you, though their lives are unimportant, but the roman knights too those most honourable and excellent men and the other virtuous citizens who are now surrounding the senate whose numbers you could see whose desires you could know and whose voices you a few minutes ago could hear i whose very hands and weapons i have for some time been scarcely able to keep off from you but those too i will easily bring to attend you to the gates if you leave these places you have been long desiring to lay waste and yet why am i speaking that anything may change your purpose that you may ever amend your life that you may meditate flight or think of voluntary banishment 
i wish the gods may give you such a mind though i see if alarmed at my words you bring your mind to go into banishment what a storm of unpopularity hangs over me if not at present while the memory of your wickedness is fresh at all events hereafter but it is worth while to incur that as long as that is but a private misfortune of my own and is unconnected with the dangers of the republic but we cannot expect that you should be concerned at your own vices that you should fear the penalties of the laws or that you should yield to the necessities of the republic for you are not o catiline one whom either shame can recall from infamy or fear from danger or reason from madness wherefore as i have said before go forth and if you wish to make me your enemy as you call me unpopular go straight into banishment i shall scarcely be able to endure all that will be said if you do so i shall scarcely be able to support my load of unpopularity if you do go into banishment at the command of the consul but if you wish to serve my credit and reputation go forth with your ill-omened band of profligates betake yourself to manlius rouse up the abandoned citizens separate yourself from the good ones wage war against your country exult in your impious banditti so that you may not seem to have been driven out by me and gone to strangers but to have gone invited into your own friends though why should i invite you by whom i know men have been already sent on to wait in arms for you at the forum aurelium who i know has fixed and agreed with manlius upon a settled day by whom i know that that silver eagle which i trust will be ruinous and fatal to you and to all your friends and to which there was set up in your house a shrine as it were of your crimes has been already sent forward need i fear that you can long do without that which you used to worship when going out to murder and from whose altars you have often transferred your impious hand to the slaughter of citizens you will go at last where your unbridled and mad desire has been long hurrying you and this causes you no grief but an incredible pleasure nature has formed you desire has trained you fortune has preserved you for this insanity not only did you never desire quiet but you never even desired any war but a criminal one you have collected a band of profligates and worthless men abandoned not only by all fortune but even by hope then what happiness will you enjoy with what delight will you exult in what pleasure will you revel when in so numerous a body of friends you neither hear nor see one good man all the toils you have gone through have always pointed to this sort of life your lying on the ground not merely to lie in wait to gratify your unclean desires but even to accomplish crimes your vigilance not only when plotting against the sleep of husbands but also against the goods of your murdered victims have all been preparations for this now you have an opportunity of displaying your splendid endurance of hunger of cold of want of everything by which in a short time you will find yourself worn out all this i effected when i procured your rejection from the consulship that you should be reduced to make attempts on your country as an exile instead of being able to distress it as a consul and that that which had been wickedly undertaken by you should be called piracy rather than war now that i may remove and avert o conscript fathers any in the least reasonable complaint from myself listen i beseech you carefully to what i say and lay it up in your inmost hearts and minds in truth if my country which is far dearer to me than my life if all italy if the whole republic were to address me marcus tullius what are you doing will you permit that man to depart whom you have ascertained to be an enemy whom you see ready to become the general of the war whom you know to be expected in the camp of the enemy as their chief the author of all this wickedness the head of the conspiracy the instigator of the slaves and abandoned citizens so that he shall seem not driven out of the city by you but let loose by you against the city 
will you not order him to be thrown into prison to be hurried off to execution to be put to death with the most prompt severity what hinders you is it the customs of our ancestors but even private men have often in this republic slain mischievous citizens is it the laws which have been passed about the punishment of roman citizens but in this city those who have rebelled against the republic have never had the rights of citizens do you fear odium with posterity are you showing fine gratitude to the roman people which has raised you a man known only by your actions of no ancestral renown through all the degrees of honor at so early an age to the very highest office if from fear of unpopularity or any danger you neglect the safety of your fellow-citizens but if you have a fear of unpopularity is that arising from the imputation of vigor and boldness or that arising from that of inactivity and indecision most to be feared when italy is laid waste by war when cities are attacked and houses in flames do you not think that you will be then consumed by a perfect conflagration of hatred to this holy address of the republic and to the feelings of those men who entertain the same opinion i will make this short answer if o conscript fathers i thought it best that catiline should be punished with death i would not have given the space of one hour to this gladiator to live in if forsooth those excellent men and most illustrious cities not only did not pollute themselves but even glorified themselves by the blood of saturninus and the gracchi and flaccus and many others of old time surely i had no cause to fear lest for slaying this parricidal murderer of the citizens any unpopularity should accrue to me with posterity and if it did threaten me to ever so great a degree yet i have always been of the disposition to think unpopularity earned by virtue and glory not unpopularity though there are some men in this body who either do not see what threatens or dissemble what they do see who have fed the hope of catiline by mild sentiments and have strengthened the rising conspiracy by not believing it influenced by whose authority many and they not wicked but only ignorant if i punished him would say that i had acted cruelly and tyrannically but i know that if he agrees at the camp of manlius to which he is going there will be no one so stupid as not to see that there has been a conspiracy no one so hardened as not to confess it but if this man alone were put to death i know that this disease of the republic would be only checked for a while not eradicated for ever but if he banishes himself and takes with him all his friends and collects at one point all the ruined men from every quarter then not only will this full-grown plague of the republic be extinguished and eradicated but also the root and seed of all future evils we have now for a long time o conscript fathers lived among these dangers and machinations of conspiracy but somehow or other the ripeness of all wickedness and of this long-standing madness and audacity has come to a head at the time of my consulship but if this man alone is removed from this piratical crew we may appear perhaps for a short time relieved from fear and anxiety but the danger will settle down and lie hid in the veins and bowels of this republic as it often happens that men afflicted with a severe disease when they are tortured with heat and fever if they drink cold water seem at first to be relieved but afterward suffer more and more severely so this disease which is in the republic if relieved by the punishment of this man will only get worse and worse as the rest will still be alive wherefore o conscript fathers let the worthless be gone let them separate themselves from the good let them collect in one place let them as i have often said before be separated from us by a wall let them cease to plot against the consul in his own house to surround the tribunal of the city praetor to besiege the senate house with swords to prepare brands and torches to burn the city let it in short be written on the brow of every citizen what his sentiments are about the republic i promise you this o conscript fathers 
that there shall be so much diligence in us the consuls so much authority in you so much virtue in the roman knights so much unanimity in all good men that you shall see everything made plain and manifest by the departure of catiline everything checked and punished with these omens o catiline be gone to your impious and nefarious war to the great safety of the republic to your own misfortune and injury and to the destruction of those who have joined themselves to you in every wickedness and atrocity then do you o jupiter who were consecrated by romulus with the same auspices as this city whom we rightly call the stay of this city and empire repel this man and his companions from your altars and from the other temples from the houses and walls of the city from the lives and fortunes of all citizens and overwhelm all enemies of good men the foes of the republic the robbers of italy men bound together by a treaty and infamous alliance of crimes dead and alive with eternal punishments End of section twelve. Section thirteen of the world's famous orations volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hollywood Fat Cat. The world's famous orations volume two the second oration against catiline by cicero sixty three b c at length o romans we have dismissed from the city or driven out or when he was departing of his own accord we have pursued with words lucius catiline mad with audacity breathing wickedness impiously planning mischief to his country threatening fire and sword to you and to the city he has gone he has departed he has disappeared he has rushed out Footnote. In the argument prefixed to the second oration against Catiline, it is said that when Catiline alleged his high birth and the stake which he had in the prosperity of the commonwealth as arguments to make it appear improbable that he should seek to injure it, and called Cicero a stranger and a new inhabitant of Rome, the Senate interrupted him with a general outcry, calling him traitor and parricide, upon which, being rendered furious and desperate, he declared aloud what he had before said to Cato that since he was circumvented and driven headlong by his enemies he would quench the flame which his enemies were kindling around him in the common ruin and so he rushed out of the temple End of footnote. no injury will now be prepared against these walls within the walls themselves by that monster and prodigy of wickedness and we have without controversy defeated him the sole general of this domestic war for now that dagger will no longer hover about our sides we shall not be afraid in the campus in the forum in the senate house ay and within our own private walls he was moved from his place when he was driven from the city now we shall openly carry on a regular war with an enemy without hindrance beyond all question we ruin the man we have defeated him splendidly when we have driven him from secret treachery into open warfare but that he has not taken with him his sword red with blood as he intended that he has left us alive that we wrested the weapon from his hands that he has left the citizens safe and the city standing what great and overwhelming grief must you think that this is to him now he lies prostrate o romans and feels himself stricken down and abject and often casts back his eyes toward this city which he mourns over as snatched from his jaws but which seems to me to rejoice at having vomited forth such a pest and cast it out of doors but if there be any one of that disposition which all men should have who yet blames me greatly for the very thing in which my speech exults and triumphs namely that i did not arrest so capital mortal an enemy rather than let him go that is not my fault o citizens but the fault of the times lucius catiline ought to have been visited with the severest punishment and to have been put to death long since and both the customs of our ancestors and the rigour of my office and the republic demanded this of me but how many think you were there who did not believe what i reported 
how many who out of stupidity did not think so how many who even defended him how many who out of their own depravity favored him if in truth i had thought that if he were removed all danger would be removed from you i would long since have cut off lucius catiline had it been at the risk not only of my popularity but even of my life but as i saw that since the matter was not even then proved to all of you if i had punished him with death as he had deserved i should be borne down by unpopularity and so be unable to follow up his accomplices i brought the business on to this point that you might be able to combat openly when you saw the enemy without disguise but how exceedingly i think this enemy to be feared now that he is out of doors you may see from this that i am vexed even that he has gone from the city with but a small retinue i wish he had taken with him all his forces he has taken with him tongillus with whom he had been said to have a criminal intimacy and publicius and munatius whose debts contracted in taverns would cause no great disquietude to the republic he has left behind him others you all know what men they are how overwhelmed with debt how powerful how noble therefore with our gallic legions and with the levies which quintus metellus has raised in the picenian and gallic territory and with these troops which are every day being got ready by us i thoroughly despise that army composed of desperate old men of clownish profligates and uneducated spendthrifts of those who have preferred to desert their bail rather than that army and which will fall to pieces if i show them not the battle array of our army but an edict of the praetor i wish he had taken with him those soldiers of his whom i see hovering about the forum standing about the senate house even coming into the senate who shine with ointment who glitter in purple and if they remain here remember that that army is not so much to be feared by us as these men who have deserted the army and they are the more to be feared because they are aware that i know what they are thinking of and yet they are not influenced by it i know to whom apulia has been allotted who has etruria who has the picenian territory who the gallic district who has begged for himself the office of spreading fire and sword by night through the city they know that all the plans of the preceding night are brought to me i laid them before the senate yesterday catiline himself was alarmed and fled why do these men wait verily they are greatly mistaken if they think that former lenity of mine will last for ever what i have been waiting for that i have gained namely that you should all see that a conspiracy has been openly formed against the republic unless indeed there be any one who thinks that those who are like catiline do not agree with catiline there is not any longer room for lenity the business itself demands severity one thing even now i will grant let them depart let them be gone let them not suffer the unhappy catiline to pine away for want of them i will tell them the road he went by the aurelian road if they make haste they will catch him by the evening o oh, happy republic if it can cast forth these dregs of the republic even now when catiline alone is got rid of the republic seems to me relieved and refreshed for what evil or wickedness can be devised or imagined which he did not conceive what prisoner what gladiator what thief what assassin what parricide what forger of wills what cheat what debauchee what spendthrift what adulterer what abandoned woman what corrupter of youth what profligate what scoundrel can be found in all italy who does not avow that he has been on terms of intimacy with catiline what murder has been committed for years without him what nefarious act of infamy that has not been done by him but in what other man were there ever so many allurements for youth as in him who both indulged in infamous love for others and encouraged their infamous affections for himself 
promising to some enjoyment of their lust to others the death of their parents and not only instigating them to iniquity but even assisting them in it but now how suddenly had he collected not only out of the city but even out of the country a number of abandoned men no one not only at rome but in every corner of italy was overwhelmed with debt whom he did not enlist in this incredible association of wickedness and that you may understand the diversity of his pursuits and the variety of his designs there was no one in any school of gladiators at all inclined to audacity who does not avow himself to be an intimate friend of catiline no one on the stage at all of a fickle and worthless disposition who does not profess himself his companion and he trained in the practice of insult and wickedness in enduring cold and hunger and thirst and watching was called a brave man by those fellows while all the appliances of industry and instruments of virtue were devoted to lust and atrocity but if his companions follow him if the infamous herd of desperate men depart from the city oh happy shall we be fortunate will be the republic illustrious will be the renown of my consulship for theirs is no ordinary insolence no common and endurable audacity they think of nothing but slaughter conflagration and rapine they have dissipated their patrimonies they have squandered their fortunes money has long failed them and now credit begins to fail but the same desires remain which they had in their time of abundance but if in their drinking and gambling parties they were content with feasts and harlots they would be in a hopeless state indeed but yet they might have endured but who can bear this that indolent men should plot against the bravest drunkards against the sober men asleep against men awake men lying at feasts embracing abandoned women languid with wine crammed with food crowned with chaplets reeking with ointments worn out with lust belch out in their discourse the murder of all good men and the conflagration of the city but i am confident that some fate is hanging over these men and that the punishment long since due to their iniquity and worthlessness and wickedness and lust is either visibly at hand or at least rapidly approaching and if my consulship shall have removed since it cannot cure them it will have added not some brief span but many ages of existence to the republic for there is no nation for us to fear no king who can make war on the roman people all foreign affairs are tranquilized both by land and sea by the valor of one man domestic war alone remains the only plots against us are within our own walls the danger is within the enemy is within we must war with luxury with madness with wickedness for this war o citizens i offer myself as the general i take on myself the enmity of profligate men what can be cured i will cure by whatever means it may be possible what must be cut away i will not suffer to spread to the ruin of the republic let them depart or let them stay quiet or if they remain in the city and in the same disposition as at present let them expect what they deserve but there are men o romans who say that catiline has been driven by me into banishment but if i could do so by a word i would drive out those also who say so forsooth that timid that excessively bashful man who could not bear the voice of the consul as soon as he was ordered to go into banishment he obeyed he was quiet yesterday when i had been all but murdered at my own house i convoked the senate in the temple of jupiter stator i related the whole affair to the conscript fathers and when catiline came thither what senator addressed him who saluted him who looked upon him not so much even as an abandoned citizen as an implacable enemy nay the chiefs of that body left that part of the benches to which he came naked and empty on this i that violent consul who drives citizens into exile by a word asked of catiline whether he had been at the nocturnal meeting at marcus lecca's or not 
when that most audacious man convicted of his own conscience was at first silent i related all the other circumstances i described what he had done that night where he had been what he had arranged for the next night how the plan of the whole war had been laid down by him when he hesitated when he was convicted i asked why he hesitated to go whither he had been long preparing to go when i knew that arms that the axes the fasces and trumpets and military standards and that silver eagle to which he had made a shrine in his own house had been sent on did i drive him into exile who i knew had already entered upon war i suppose manlius that centurion who has pitched his camp in the faisalan district has proclaimed war against the roman people in his own name and that camp is not now waiting for catiline as its general and he driven forsooth into exile will go to marseilles as they say and not to that camp oh the hard lot of those not only of those who govern but even of those who save the republic now if lucius catiline hemmed in and rendered powerless by my counsels by my toils by my dangers should on a sudden become alarmed should change his designs should desert his friends should abandon his design of making war should change his path from this course of wickedness and war and betake himself to flight and exile he will not be said to have been deprived by me of the arms of his audacity to have been astounded and terrified by my diligence to have been driven from his hope and from his enterprise but uncondemned and innocent to have been driven into banishment by the consul by threats and violence and there will be some who will seek to have him thought not worthless but unfortunate and me considered not a most active consul but a most cruel tyrant i am not unwilling o romans to endure this storm of false and unjust popularity as long as the danger of this horrible and nefarious war is warded off from you let him be said to be banished by me as long as he goes into banishment but believe me he will not go i will never ask of the immortal gods o romans for the sake of lightening my own unpopularity for you to hear that lucius catiline is leading an army of enemies and is hovering about in arms but yet in three days you will hear it and i much more fear that it will be objected to me some day or other that i have let him escape rather than that i have banished him but when there are men who say he has been banished because he has gone away what would these men say if he had been put to death but those men who keep saying that catiline is going to marseilles do not complain of this so much as they fear it for there is not one of them so inclined to pity as not to prefer that he should go to manlius rather than to marseilles but he if he had never before planned what he is now doing yet would rather be slain while living as a bandit than live as an exile except indeed that he has left rome while we are alive let us wish rather that he may go into exile than complain of it but why are we speaking so long about one enemy and about that enemy who now avows that he is one and whom i now do not fear because as i have always wished a wall is between us and are saying nothing about those who dissemble who remain at rome who are among us whom indeed if it were by any means possible i should be anxious not so much to chastise as to cure and to make friendly to the republic nor if they will listen to me do i quite know why that may not be for i will tell you o romans of what classes of men those forces are made up and then if i can i will apply to each the medicine of my advice and persuasion there is one class of them who with enormous debts have still greater possessions and who by no means be detached from their affection to them of these men the appearance is most respectable for they are wealthy but their intention and their cause are most shameless will you be rich in lands in houses in money in slaves in all things and yet hesitate to diminish your possessions to add to your credit what are you expecting war what in the devastation of all things do you believe that your own possessions will be held sacred 
do you expect an abolition of debts they are mistaken who expect that from catiline there may be schedules made out owing to my exertions but they will be only catalogues of sale nor can those who have possessions be safe by any other means and if they had been willing to adopt this plan earlier and not as is very foolish to struggle on against usury with the profits of their farms we should have them now richer and better citizens but i think these men are the least of all to be dreaded because they can either be persuaded to abandon their opinions or if they cling to them they seem to me more likely to form wishes against the republic than to bear arms against it there is another class of them who although they are harassed by debt yet are expecting supreme power they wish to become masters they think that when the republic is in confusion they may gain those honors which they despair of when it is in tranquillity and they must i think be told the same as every one else to despair of obtaining what they are aiming at that in the first place i myself am watchful for am present to am providing for the republic besides that there is a high spirit in the virtuous citizens great unanimity great numbers and also a large body of troops above all that the immortal gods will stand by and bring aid to this invincible nation this most illustrious empire this most beautiful city against such wicked violence and if they had already got that which they with the greatest madness wish for do they think that in the ashes of the city and blood of the citizens which in their wicked and infamous hearts they desire they will become consuls and dictators and even kings do they not see that they are wishing for that which if they were to obtain it must be given up to some fugitive slave or some gladiator there is a third class already touched by age but still vigorous from constant exercise of which class is manlius himself whom catiline is now succeeding these are men of those colonies which sulla established at Faisulae, which i know to be composed on the whole of excellent citizens and brave men but yet these are colonists who from becoming possessed of unexpected and sudden wealth boast themselves extravagantly and insolently these men while they build like rich men while they delight in farms in litters in vast families of slaves in luxurious banquets have incurred such great debts that if they would be saved they must raise sulla from the dead and they have even excited some countrymen poor and needy men to entertain the same hopes of plunder as themselves and all these men o oh romans i place in the same class of robbers and banditti but i warn them let them cease to be mad and to think of proscriptions and dictatorships for such a horror of these times is ingrained into the city that not even men but it seems to me that even the very cattle would refuse to bear them again there is a fourth class various promiscuous and turbulent who indeed are even now overwhelmed who will never recover themselves who partly from indolence partly from managing their affairs badly partly from extravagance are embarrassed by old debts and worn out with bail bonds and judgments and seizures of their goods are said to be betaking themselves in numbers to that camp both from the city and the country these men i think not so much active soldiers as lazy insolvents who if they cannot stand at first may fall but fall so that not only the city but even their nearest neighbors know nothing of it for i do not understand why if they cannot live with honor they should wish to die shamefully or why they think they shall perish with less pain in a crowd than if they perish by themselves there is a fifth class of parricides assassins in short of all infamous characters whom i do not wish to recall from catiline and indeed they cannot be separated from him let them perish in their wicked war since they are so numerous that a prison cannot contain them there is a last class not only in number but in the sort of men and in their way of life the especial bodyguard of catiline of his levying 
i the friends of his embraces and of his bosom whom you see with carefully combed hair glossy beardless or with well-trimmed beards with tunics with sleeves or reaching to the ankles and clothed with veils not with robes all the industry of whose life all the labor of whose watchfulness is expended in suppers lasting till daybreak in these bands are all the gamblers all the adulterers all the unclean and shameless citizens these boys so witty and delicate have learned not only to love and be loved not only to sing and to dance but also to brandish daggers and to administer poisons and unless they are driven out unless they die even should catiline die i warn you that the school of catiline would exist in the republic but what do those wretches want are they going to take their wives with them to the camp how can they do without them especially in these nights and how will they endure the apennines and these frosts and this snow unless they think that they will bear the winter more easily because they have been in the habit of dancing naked at their feasts oh war much to be dreaded when catiline is going to have his bodyguard of prostitutes array now o romans against these splendid troops of catiline your guards and your armies and first of all oppose to that worn-out and wounded gladiator your consuls and generals then against that banished and enfeebled troop of ruined men lead out the flower and strength of all italy instantly the cities of the colonies and municipalities will match the rustic mounds of catiline and i will not condescend to compare the rest of your troops and equipments and guards with the want and destitution of that highwayman but if omitting all these things in which we are rich and of which he is destitute the senate the roman knights the people the city the treasury the revenues all italy all the provinces foreign nations if i say omitting all these things we choose to compare the causes themselves which are opposed to one another we may understand from that alone how thoroughly prostrate they are for on the one side are fighting modesty on the other wantonness on the one chastity on the one piety on the other wickedness on the one consistency on the other insanity on the one honour on the other baseness on the one continence on the other lust in short equity temperance fortitude prudence all the virtues contend against iniquity with luxury against indolence against rashness against all the vices lastly abundance contends against destitution good plans against baffled designs wisdom against madness well-founded hope against universal despair in a contest and war of this sort even if the zeal of men were to fail will not the immortal gods compel such numerous and excessive vices to be defeated by these most eminent virtues and as this is the case o romans do ye as i have said before defend your house with guards and vigilance i have taken care and made arrangements that there shall be sufficient protection for the city without distressing you and without any tumult all the colonists and citizens of your municipal towns being informed by me of this nocturnal sally of catiline will easily defend their cities and territories the gladiators which he thought would be his most numerous and most trusty band although they are better disposed than part of the patricians will be held in check by our power quintus metellus whom i making provision for this sent on to the gallic and picenian territory will either overwhelm the man or will prevent all his motions and attempts but with respect to the arrangements of all other matters and maturing and acting on our plans we shall consult the senate which as you are aware is convened now once more i wish those who have remained in the city and who contrary to the safety of the city and of all of you have been left in the city by catiline although they are enemies yet because they were born citizens to be warned again and again by me if my lenity has appeared to any one too remiss it has been only waiting that that might break out which was lying hid 
as to the future i cannot now forget that this is my country that i am the consul of these citizens that i must either live with them or die for them there is no guard at the gate no one plotting against their path if any one wishes to go he can provide for himself but if any one stirs in the city and if i detect not only any action but any attempt or design against the country he shall feel that there are in this city vigilant consuls eminent magistrates a brave senate arms and prisons which our ancestors appointed as the avengers of nefarious and convicted crimes and all this shall be so done o romans that affairs of the greatest importance shall be transacted with the least possible disturbance the greatest danger shall be avoided without any tumult and internal civil war the most cruel and terrible in the memory of man shall be put an end to by me alone in the robe of peace acting as general and commander-in-chief and this i will so arrange o romans that if it can be by any means managed even the most worthless man shall not suffer the punishment of his crimes in this city but if the violence of open audacity if the danger impending over the republic drives me of necessity from this merciful disposition at all events i will manage this which seems scarcely even to be hoped for in so great and so treacherous a war that no good man shall fall and that you may all be saved by the punishment of a few and i promise you this o romans relying neither on my own prudence nor on human counsels but on many and manifest intimations of the will of the immortal gods under whose guidance i first entertained this hope and this opinion who are now defending their temples and the houses of the city not afar off as they were used to from a foreign and distant enemy but here on the spot by their own divinity and present help and you o romans ought to pray to and implore them to defend from the nefarious wickedness of abandoned citizens now that all the forces of all enemies are defeated by land and sea this city which they have ordained to be the most beautiful and flourishing of all cities End of section thirteen.